So in this chapter, we're going to be talking about um, aggression. And the first two parts of the chapter, we're going to be talking first about um, basically theories about aggression. Is it innate? Is it learned? Is it optional? Is it something we can control? Um, and then we'll also talk about different social situations and aggression. All right. And uh, um, like I said, it's a good idea to print out these slides and to um, have them to make notes on as you um, as you read through the chapter. All right. Or as you listen to my video lecture. All right. All right. So let's talk about our learning objectives. So we want to distinguish what the different theories of aggression are that are out there. There's evolutionary theory, cultural theories, um, learning theory um, about aggression. Okay, so we're going to talk about those different ones. Um, and then we're going to look at specific situational and social causes of aggression that have been studied with research by social psychologists. Okay. So let's talk first a little bit about definitions and get that out of the way, okay? So what is aggression? What is aggression? Aggression, um, this is intentional behavior aimed at causing physical harm or psychological pain to another person. Okay, now don't confuse this with assertiveness. Um, even though most people loosely refer to others as aggressive, if they stand up for their rights, write letters to the editors, or complain about real or imagined injustices, that's not aggression. That's assertiveness. Okay, aggression is actual um, ca causing harm. Okay, um, similarly, in a sexist society, you'll ha you'll you'll hear people call a woman who's simply speaking up or speaking her mind or taking the initiative and inv inviting a man to dinner, she might be called aggressive by some, but that's not what aggression is, okay? Aggression is intentional behavior aimed at causing physical harm or psychological pain to another person. Okay, so let's talk about some types of aggression. Um, instrumental aggression is aggression as a means to some goal other than causing pain. So you're still intending to hurt the other person, but the hurting takes place as a means to some other goal um, other than just causing pain. For example, like in professional football, uh, a defensive lineman will do whatever it takes to thwart his opponent. Um, that is the blocker and tackle um, whoever's got the ball. So this, in, this typically includes... This typically includes intentionally inflicting pain if doing so is useful to help uh, get the blocker out of the way so that he can get to the person carrying the ball. So this is instrumental aggression, okay? So the key here is the intent. If the intent is to cause pain or cause uh, either, f either physical or psychological pain, right, that's aggression, right, that intent. Um, hostile aggression is aggression stemming from feelings of anger and aimed at inf inflicting pain or injury. So hostile aggression is actually um, you're trying to cause them pain because they, you feel like um, you've, been you've been angered or you've been um, injured in some way, right? So you're, you're hostile, okay? Now what about different views on aggression and where it comes from? Well, in the, if you look at the evolutionary view, um, how do we get to where we are with aggression from an evolutionary standpoint? Well, <clears throat> a lot of gender differences um, people use as to, ex to explain aggression from an evolutionary point of view. Um, <clears throat> men are more aggressive. So um, um, according to evolutionary theory, uh, men behave aggressively in order to secure status. Um, evolutionary wise, the female chooses the male who offers the greatest protection and the, and resources. So, um, in this way, uh, men would have behaved aggressively to secure status. Um, also ma males aggress jealously, um, evolutionarily to ensure their paternity, right? 
they don't let anybody else get around their mates because that ensures that their genes get carried on that ensures their paternity right so those are the two reasons that uh, males are theorized to aggress to establish dominance um, and secure their status and the other is to protect um, uh, that their um, that their genes are getting passed on through paternity so they're protecting their females from other males right so that would be looking at um, how aggression is explained using evolutionary theory okay um, and support for this from the fact that what testosterone um, uh, is linked to greater aggression although most of these findings are correlational not causational call not causal um, uh, testosterone is found actually in men and women although it's in higher proportion in men um, we do know that laboratory animals injected with testosterone become more aggressive um, so there's a parallel finding in humans um, uh, And we don't know whether these are causal uh, all the studies are correlational so the causality could re run in either direction studies that show that prisoners convicted of violent crimes um, have higher testosterone than prisoners convicted of nonviolent crimes um, similarly um, juveniles um, juvenile delinquent are have higher testosterone than do college students however we don't know what came first the 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 aggressive aggression or the testosterone right uh, being in an aggressive competitive or um, sexual a situation increases the production of testosterone right so we don't know which one came first the testosterone or the aggression okay so that's important to note that the findings with tes linking testosterone to greater aggression are only correlational not causal right so from the evolutionary vo viewpoint then if boys are aggressing against each other that's just boys being boys right um, be uh, boys are more likely than girls the world over to roughhouse and pummel each other so is this evidence of hostile or instrumental aggression or just a physical play right well we're not sure but we psychologists have been studying this different ways we've looked at other primates we've looked at other species and what have we found well when we look at aggression in other animals um, there's all kinds of interesting things we can see for instance um, most people assume that cats will instinctively stalk and kill rats so Kuo attempted to demonstrate that this was a myth so he did a little experiment where he raised a cat a kitten in the same cage with a rat not only did the cat refrain from attacking the rat but the two became close companions moreover when given the opportunity the cat refused either to chase or kill other rats thus um, the benign behavior on the cat's part was not confined to the one rat that the cat lived with but generalized to other rats um, that the cat had never met so uh, although it, this experiment was really unique it doesn't prove that aggressive behavior is not instinctive it merely demonstrates that aggressive instinct can be inhibited um, by our early experiences um, so what if an organism organism grows up without any contact with other organisms will it or won't it show aggressive tendencies well when they've done this with rats um, if they raise rats in isolation then they'll attack fellow fellow rats when one is introduced into the cage um, so even though the aggressive behavior is modified by experiences apparently aggression does not need to be learned it's in, can be instinctive okay so let's talk about primates so humans closest relatives in the animal kingdom let's talk about chimps and bonobos 
Both species have 98% of their DNA in common with human beings. Wow, 98% of their DNA is in common with human beings, right? However, the chimpanzee, chimpanzee is known for its aggressive behavior. Um, the females also can be pretty mean. Um, it is the only non-human species in which groups of male members hunt and kill other members of their own kind. Um, indeed, at about the same rate, the humans in hunter-gatherer societies kill each other. Wow, that's crazy. Um, uh, so based on the research on chimps, we might conclude that humans, especially males, are genetically programmed for aggressive behavior. However, living across the river from the chimps and out of their reach are the bonobos, our equally close genetic relatives. Unlike the chimp, the bonobo is known for its non-aggressive behavior. In fact, bonobos are often referred to as the make love, not war ape. Prior to engaging in, act in activities that could otherwise lead to conflict, bonobos have sex, an activity that functions to diffuse potential conflict. Thus, when the group arrives at a feeding ground, they first enjoy some sexual play and then proceed to eat peacefully. In contrast, when chips chimps arrive at a chimpanzees arrive at a feeding ground they compete aggressively for the food also unlike the chimps bonobos form female dominated societies and are known for their sensitivity to others in their group wow the bonobo way of life is a rare exception in the animal kingdom the near universality of aggression strongly suggests that aggressiveness has evolved and has been maintained because it has survival value right so there again back to the evolutionary theory about it Aggressiveness has, um, has evolved and has been maintained because it has survival value. Um, okay, and we also know that at the same time, nearly all organisms also seem to have evolved strong inhibitory mechanisms that enable them to suppress aggression when it is in their best interest to do so, right? Um, and we know that aggression is determined by the animal's previous social experiences as well as by the sp specific social context in which the animal finds itself. Wow. Okay. A lot of information there. Okay. So it's very interesting. So we can ask ourselves the question then, are all primates naturally aggressive? No, right? Because of what we just talked about, when people say that aggression is natural, they point often to chimps, right? That picture on the left, who indeed are pretty belligerent and aggressive. But bonobos, I'm sorry, yes, bonobos, the picture on the right, would rather make love than war, right? So um, it just depends on which, what primate you're talking about, right? Culture and aggression. Aggression is an optional strategy. Uh, most psychologists believe that aggression is optional, right? Um, we are born with our capacity for aggressive behavior. Um, so that capacity for aggression exists. Um, however, uh, how, where, when we express it is learned and depends on our circumstances and our culture, okay? Because of the complexity and importance of our interactions, um, once again, we know that the social situation becomes more important than hormones or pregenetic dispositions, right? So we think in terms of um, changing social conditions as changing our behavior, right? Um, uh, so people might be very peaceful um, but there might be something that causes aggressiveness, such as um, maybe uh, some sort of social change occurs that increases competition, right? So then aggressiveness increases as competition increases. For example, for hundreds of years, the Iroquois of North America lived peacefully. They were a hunting uh, nation. Uh, they, did, they were not aggressive against other tribes. But then when Europeans... Um, came around in the 17, I'm sorry, in the 18, no, in the 1600s. Um, uh, and Iroquois started bartering with them. That put them in direct competition with, 
the neighboring Hurons over furs. So then the Iroquois competed with Hurons to sell fur to the Europeans. And um, it created a whole series of skirmishes. Um, and eventually it developed into um, uh, wars, right? And the Iroquois developed into ferocious warriors. Um, <clears throat> so it would be hard to argue that they were these amazing warriors because of their uncontrollable aggressive instincts. Rather, they developed this aggressiveness uh, through the learning and the conflict that they had with the, with the um, Hurons, okay? So again, we see that, we see that the changing social conditions uh, changed their behavior, okay? So um, we also know from European history um, uh, like, um, really any European country you can look at, there's a series of major wars one after the other, right? But if you look at prim primitive tribes, um, such as like the pygmies of Central Africa, um, they always lived pretty much in peace and harmony with, with aggression being pretty rare, okay? Um, and... Another uh, good example of this is that there's also uh, a hunter-gatherer culture in the Philippine rainforest called the Forest Tedure, um, who have, they've got institutions and norms that are designed to prevent intergroup violence. And people pay special attention in their societies to the effects of their actions on the feelings of others. So when a situation does arise, um, like for instance, um, uh, like adultery, um, which when there's, when there's a big risk that anger could lead to violence, specific members of the village will work to placate the inju the injured individuals. Um, so the Tedure believe that humans are violent by nature, but that intergroup violence is not the way to live. So they'll engage, um, so they will, um, in, they will, uh, create group norms to protect themselves from aggression, right? Of honor. So again, I, we've talked about cultures of honor before. Um, I think, maybe not. Um, these are regional differences that we see in aggressive behavior in the U.S. These cultures of honor are the aggressive <laughs> cultures because um, this is when... Um, in basically in herding societies um, where uh, you had to protect your your herd, your cattle from uh, thievery, uh, you had to be hyper alert and respond to threats with force. And it fo fostered this culture of honor, which is uh, when the men would respond aggressively uh, to restore status, when the men's uh, and their reputation for toughness was um, very important to have, right? They had to have this um, this culture of honor. So they, they would um, basically shoot it out on Main Street, right? They would have a shootout on Main Street. And this was um, the early economies of the American South and West uh, created this culture of honor in which a man was literally quick on the trigger if he thought somebody else, another man, was about to smear his reputation or steal his cattle, right? So shoot first, ask questions later sort of um, behavior. So quite aggressive. So let's talk a little bit about um, aggressiveness um, and gender. Um, and s let's see if we can um, tease out some, some differences that we see um, pretty much across the board that research has found. In terms of physical aggression, men are much more likely to be perpetrators of extreme violence in families, like 8 out of 10 um, murderers who kill a family member are men, um, and men are more likely to inflict serious injury if they, if they beat up on someone, right? Um, which would make sense since, since um, you know, uh, on average, men are larger than women. Um, we don't see uh, gender differences in terms of uh, physical aggressiveness, meaning 
Um, just as many women are aggressive as men are aggressive. It's just that the women, the men are much more physically aggressive. Um, uh, whereas, um, the women, perhaps we're going to see more of what we call relational aggression. Okay. What's relational aggression? Relational aggression is harming another person through manipulation. Um, so it can be like, um, uh, back, you know, backbiting, shunning, or spreading false rumors about another person, right? So women are more likely to be perpetrators of relational aggression, okay? So if you look at this chart, let me show you this chart. This is the lifetime prevalence of physical violence uh, by an intimate partner. And you'll see here that um, clearly women um, are more likely to be the target of physical violence um, by their intimate partners. Women are the blue line here. So just about any of the, I think all of the um, different categories of um, types of physical aggressiveness, um, the, uh, the women are inflicted more than the men. Um, uh, so clearly men are much more uh, physically aggressive than women, okay? But the question then becomes why? Why is that? And why is it more likely for a woman to be more relationally aggressive, right? So let's look at social cognitive learning theory that might help us explain this difference. Well, what the heck is that? Well, social cognitive learning theory is about learning to behave aggressively, right? According to this theory, people learn social behavior by watching others and imitating others. So we don't learn just positive behavior, like helping behaviors, um, altruism, but we also learn negative behaviors, like aggressive behavior, behaviors, right? By, um, through observation and imitation, okay? And what's the famous story that we're going to talk about that shows us, lear us uh, children's ability to learn aggression by just watching it? Did you guess Bandura's Bobo doll studies? Well, then, yes, you guessed correctly. <laughs> so in the Bobo doll studies, in the Bobo doll studies, um, we saw um, what? Well, we saw that Bandura had this research question. Will watching an aggressive model cause children to behave aggressively? And what happened? Well, let's talk about it. What was the study? Our independent variable was we were, was uh, children's exposure to aggressive model, right? So the aggressive model was an adult who knocked around, kicked, hammered, um, and hit a plastic air-filled bobo doll, okay? Um, another level of the independent variable was the control, control condition, where there was no exposure to this aggressive model, right, of this adult knocking around. Um, the bobo doll. That was the control condition. Um, the dependent variable was the child's aggression. So how does the kid act uh, when he, he or she sees the bobo doll? So I bet you can guess what happens. <laughs> so the adult, before we talk about what happened, let's talk about again how, what aggression was modeled. Well, the adult would smack the doll around with the palm of their hand. They would hit it with a mallet. They would kick it. They would yell aggressively at it right? They would do all these things. Okay, so then what happened when the kids were allowed to play with the doll? Well, the results were that the children imitated the aggressive adults, right? So they treated the doll the same abusive way. Um, they used identical actions and they used identical aggressive words as the adult models. Um, and and many even went beyond mere imitation. They also engaged in novel forms of aggressive behavior. Um, so they would do things that the adults hadn't even done. Um, uh, so um, whereas the children in the control, control condition almost never showed aggression towards the Boba doll, right? So that was the clear difference between um, the d different levels of the independent variable. If they'd seen aggression, they behaved aggressively. If they'd not seen aggression, they did not show aggression. So very, very 
fascinating. Okay, um, there is a link here to um, the to uh, it's really a great um, little video about the original um, Bobo doll experiment, and I um, I encourage you to watch this this video. Um, and uh, you can you can just if you download these PowerPoint slides, then you can you'll be able to um, to get this uh, to to see this link to the Bobo doll experiment. You probably could also just Google it and pull it up pretty easily. Okay, so let's talk about what might be some physiological influence on aggression. So we do know that alcohol very much increases aggression. This is well documented in research, okay? Why does it do this? Well, um, alcohol reduces our anxiety and our inhibitions. It disrupts our information processing, our cognitive processing, right? So we, ha we get what's called a think-drink effect. Um, uh, and this is, we expect to be impaired by alcohol, therefore it, we, we let it influence our behavior. Um, so that's an interesting um, phenomenon, right? Um, so we, what do we know then? We know that when individuals ingest enough alcohol to make them legally drunk, they tend to respond more violently to, to provocations than those who have ingested little or no alcohol, right? Um, we also know when people expect alcohol to have certain effects on them, it often does. So when they think that alcohol will release their aggressive impulses, it does, right? So that plays into that whole idea of um, expectations or that think-drink effect, okay? What other things might influence um, uh, our aggressiveness? Well, we know that pain increases aggression. Um, uh, if, it, if, for instance, an animal is in pain and can't, can't leave, can't flee the scene, it will always attack. This is true of rats, mice, hamsters, foxes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, in fact, the animals will attack members of their own species or, or anything else in sight, including um, so stuffed dolls and tennis balls, which they've shown in research. Also, we know discomfort increases aggression, right? If it's t too hot or too humid, if there's heavy air pollution, if there's offensive odors, all these things will increase discomfort, which increases aggression. So let me show you this cool chart. So this is called the long hot summer. Um, so someone one time decided they should look at uh, whether temperature could predict um, violent crime and other types of aggression. Well, sure enough. Um, we see that the more there's a departure from the average local temperature, um, the higher the number of violent crimes, right? Um, so if it gets colder, there's less crime. If it gets hotter, there's more crime, right? Very interesting, okay? Like we've hinted at before, um, different social situations will cause or, or be responsible for aggression being more likely to erupt, right? Um, so there's a theory called the frustration aggression theory that we're going to talk about um, that defines like when, uh, when aggression is most likely to happen and what different s sorts of social situations. And frustration aggression theory is just basically the idea that um, when you're prevented from attaining a goal, uh, you're more likely to, um, to have an aggressive response when you're, you're feeling that frustration, right? And we all know, like in this picture, uh -huh, how this woman is feeling, right? She's obviously experiencing road rage um, because she's frustrated because she's obviously trying to get somewhere and she can't get there. And so she's feeling very aggressive, okay? So, um, is road rage inve inevitable? Inevitable when you're frustrated with other drivers who get in your way? Um, not necessarily, right? Um, so there's sometimes uh, you don't get angry, uh, whereas other times people do get angry when you're sitting in traffic. So there's different um, different reasons why you might feel be be uh, more likely to respond aggressively. For instance. Um, if you are closer to your goal, 
um, that goal proximity. If it's um, if you're closer to your goal, then you um, may feel more aggressive, more likely to respond aggressively. And they've shown this in research. Um, for instance, they did a study where they had um, people standing in line and they had a Confederate cut in the line. Um, this was like in lines for movie tickets, um, in lines to get into restaurants, to check out of supermarkets, right? So um, sometimes the Confederate cut in front of the second person in line, and at other times he cut in front of the 12th person in line. So where do you think he got the most aggressive response? Well, he got the most aggressive response when he, when he cut in front of the second person in line, right? Because they were people who were about to get out, get up to the checkout counter. So they were much more likely to be aggressive with him cutting in the line um, than the people who were the 12th in line, right? Okay. And we also see this in terms of the une unexpectedness of the frustration. Um, if it was unexpected, um, that the frustration occurred and then you're more likely to get an, an aggressive response. Okay. Um, we can also realize that when you feel frustrated, of course, that's not always going to lead to aggression, right? It's going to, you're probably going to feel anger, right? When you're frustrated. So it's going to increase your readiness to aggress, to aggress or to um, show aggression, right? Um, so it makes sense. Um, you feel frustration, um, you get angry, um, you might aggress, right? Well, that, uh, that frustration aggressive link depends on things. What does it depend on? Well, well that frustration aggression link depends on uh, some things like for instance the size and strength of the person responsible for your frustration if they're bigger than you then you're much less likely to become aggressive towards them um, also you might be worried about whether or not they can retaliate um, if you don't think they can be retaliate then you're much more likely to be aggressive if you think they can re retaliate then you're much less likely to be aggressive and also their proximity are they right there with you or are they down the street, right? Um, so that's going to impact um, uh, whether, you're, whether you are going to be aggressive after you are frustrated or not, right? So um, what we see is, what we're seeing here is that this frustration aggression link, um, that your frustration um, may or may not lead to aggression. Um, when it's understandable and it's, uh, for legitimate reasons, or maybe, uh, the person frustrating you did it unintentionally, all these, those things are going to be reasons why the frustration is not going to lead to actual aggression. Like you might feel angry, you might be frustrated and feel angry, but you might not actually aggress, um, because you know, you understand what happened or you realize how le legitimate it is, right? The person in front of you has a flat tire or, um, you know, something like that. It's understandable. It's legitimate. It's unintentional. So you're not necessarily likely to fly into road rage and ram into the back of their car. Um, you're not as likely to be aggressive, even though you are frustrated, right? Okay. at deprivation and aggression um, they thought well maybe um, maybe people who are deprived of something are more likely to be aggressive well no it's only um, relative deprivation might be linked to uh, frustration and aggression but not, not absolute deprivation so for instance um, if you think about think about kids who don't have toys they're not necessarily going to be more aggressive than children that do have toys, right? So in toy experiments, um, uh, the frustration and the aggression occurred when the kids had every reason to expect to play with the toys and their reasonable expectation was thwarted, right? So when the, this reasonable expectation was thwarted, then the children tended to behave destructively, right? So it was relative deprivation, not absolute deprivation, right? Social scientists have found that it is um, uh, 
absolute deprivation um, doesn't necessarily cause the aggression, but relative deprivation, when there's a perceived discrepancy between what people have and people think they should have, uh, when that occurs, that you get this ag aggressive tendency. Um, an example of this would be the nationwide ra race riots, um, 1967 and 1968. Um, and that's when there was um, uh, expectations of people of getting out of poverty and there was increased social spending to fight poverty and um, the most serious race riots occurred not in the the geographic areas of greatest poverty but in LA and Detroit where things were not nearly as bad um, uh, as they were in most other large urban centers but the conditions were bad relative to the rioters perceptions of how the whites were doing um, and relative to the positive changes that African Americans um, had a right to expect. This, thus, an important cause of their aggression was this relative deprivation, this perception that they had less than they deserved, less than they'd been led to expect, or less than what p people similar to you have, right? So that's a good example of that relative deprivation leading to frustration and aggression, okay? Now, what about when we look at uh, when people are provoked, right? Let's talk about provocation and reciprocation. Um, when you're provoked with aggression, people reciprocate with, re with regression. Um, when will we not reciprocate with, with aggression? Well, maybe the provocation was unintentional, or maybe there's other mitigating circumstances um, that you know about when the provocation occurs, right? Um, so, for instance, in one study, students were insulted by um, the experimenter's assistants, um, and then half of them were told that the assistant was upset because they'd received an unfair low grade on a chemistry exam, um, uh, and then, whereas the other students received this information about the assistant's uh, bad grade on the chemistry exam only after the insult was delivered. Um, anyway, after they all had a chance to retaliate, those who knew about the mitigating circumstances before being insulted were less likely to deliver um, uh, less intense bursts of noise um, uh, to zap the assistant's to zap the assistant than those who received the information after um, the, uh, the, um, they were aggressed upon, right? So, um, so that, that was a, showed that uh, the interpretation um, was bolstered by evidence of the physiological arousal. So when the people were insulted, um, those who um, knew what was going on with the assistant, they did not have the, the physiological response um, as the other people did, right? We also can see this interesting uh, um, interaction between uh, aggressive cues and, and uh, aggression, right? So we've, there's been some research that's looked at weapons as aggressive cues, and we see this, what we call the weapons effect, okay? And this is an increase in aggression that can occur simply because of there's a gun or another weapon present, right? So um, this is some really interesting research. Uh, there was a classic experiment done um, where they looked at uh, the average duration of shocks administered by angry subjects um, when there was a gun in the room or when there was a badminton racket, racket in the room. So you see the, the blue bar is the, um, the duration of the shocks um, and you see that the vertical y-axis, that's the number of seconds. So they, they were much more uh, longer uh, duration of shocks um, uh, when there was a gun in the room than when there was a bid badminton racket in the room, okay? So when, they were, when college students were made angry in a room in which there was a gun, um, they were much more likely to deliver a longer shock than participants who were ma made angry when there was a neutral object such as the badminton racket laying in the, in the room, right? So um, the mere presence of the gun um, 
resulted in more aggressiveness, right? And this basic finding has been replicated in many studies uh, in the United States and the U.S. In the, I'm sorry, in the United States and in Europe, right? Um, so these findings point to a conclusion opposite to the familiar slogan often used by opponents of gun control that guns don't kill, people do. Actually, guns do kill. Um, as Leonard Berkowitz put it, an angry person can pull the trigger of his gun if he wants to commit violence, but the trigger can also pull the finger or otherwise elicit aggressive reactions um, from him if he is ready to aggress and does not have strong inhibitions against such behavior. Aggressive cues, such as weapons, tend to increase levels of aggression, right? Very interesting research.